started, but go ahead and continue eating as um, if you're not done. I'd like to thank the Next Generation Youth Leadership for coming out today. So they're over here at this table. And also give uh, Slick Back a big round of applause. That was good. And then I'm going to call on Jody um, to introduce a speaker here. Or not a speaker, but just a <laughs> guest. I want to introduce you all to Melissa Roberts. She is the business services consultant, did I get that right, for the Career Center. She is just getting started. She's going to be meeting with a whole lot of our business leaders to talk about staffing solutions that the Career Center can help with and things like that. So you'll be seeing her around. Melissa, you, need, you have anything to say? <laughs> Chamber of Excellence. Mm -hmm. Ohio County Chamber wants to recognize its members for their success and contributions. And the Chamber Excellent Award is a quarterly recognition presented to a member of the Chamber, either an individual or a business that demonstrates a continuing active interest in the well-being of the Chamber and Ohio County. The recipient will have met any or all the criteria, and they are actively promotes and assists the Chamber with its recruitment of new members, attends Chamber meetings uh, and activities, participates in Chamber activities, and supports the organization by planning of Chamber events, and, pursue, and pursues new opportunities for the Chamber and Ohio County by just demonstrating leadership and commitment to the well-being of the Chamber and Ohio County. Um, the, I want to go over the first, uh, the other quarterly um, award winners. The first quarter was Fuller Physical Therapy. The second quarter was Citizens Bank. And the fourth quarter was Beef Old Brady's. And the fourth quarter excellent award is Ohio County Healthcare. talked about the chamber is about growing business and I want to say thank you to our Chamber of Commerce I, I've been fortunate enough in my 17 years to have been involved with them on many different levels and I always appreciate how they reach out and they they nurture and support our businesses and um, if y'all will indulge me real quick I'd like to introduce some of the ways that we grow business which is how it allows us to continue to support our chamber activity so with that I'm going to ask some of our newest members of our medical staff and some members of our medical staff to stay in I'm gonna do a quick introduction so first we've got Dr. John Jeffries. Dr. Jeffries is brand new to Ohio County. And he's a general surgeon. He um, grew up here in Kentucky and he's anxious to take care of all your general surgical needs. Uh, next we have Dr. Nicole Akers. Dr. Akers opened a family medicine practice with us at Ohio County Family Care. Both of these um, physicians started with us in October. So we're pretty proud and growth in that area that we brought two new physicians into our community, which is strong economic growth. 
these physicians are the ones who are going to help us keep growing our services and um, moving forward. In addition, we have Dr. Bob Knox. Dr. Knox has joined us here at Chamber several times. Dr. Knox not only provides strong um, ear, nose, and throat services and surgical services to Hockney Healthcare, but he also helps provide um, medical um, leadership guidance to um, our specialty care services. So he helps those strategic planning that helps us get to the point that we're building that $20 million new expansion onto the hospital come next year. So we appreciate these, um, these three representatives of our medical staff. We appreciate each of you all and thank you. Thank you, CC. Now I'd like to call on Tiffany Webster. Um, she's going to give a recap on the Small Business Saturday. Okay, that's fine. Um, we're getting everything geared down for Small Business Saturday, so as a retailer, I know I'm super excited. Um, we're going to have 10 tote bags at every retail location. So if you're out and about on that day, if you're one of the first 10 customers at those retailers, um, then you'll get a free tote bag. If you are one of those retailers, I really appreciate you joining in with us and helping to bring all the business here um, on Small Business Saturday. Uh, the last thing is there is a map that you'll see. It'll slide through in a, a few minutes. That is new to this year, and it has every business participating, and it's the logo on there. Um, so if you see that on Facebook, share that with your friends. Uh, we're going to try to bring on the map at the locations, too. And there will be a brand prize for the customers that do actually go to each one and get it checked off at the end. So just help us spread the word with your customers, um, and if you can come out that day, we appreciate it, too. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. <coughs> now I'm just going to go over some um, announcements. Uh, don't forget the voting for the annual awards ends on Saturday, November 30th. If you haven't voted for your favorite in each category, do it today. Um, the Christmas Gala, the location has changed to New Assembly Church, and it's going to be held December 17th. Invitations will be going out next week. Make sure you RSVP your business for dinner reservations. And if you would like to sponsor on gold <clears throat> or platinum level, um, must let Judy know no later than today, tomorrow to get the name on the backdrop. And come prepared to be bid, bidding on some pretty special auction items that we have um, on the list. And um, our senior, senior Angel Tree program of 2019, um, we have about 60 seniors, if not more, in our community that are in need of Christmas. Our goal is to try and to give out socks, gloves, hats, lap throws, Kansas soup, and um, the tops to pull open, and boxes of crackers. If you would like to know, if you would like to, or know of anyone that would like to help out at the Senior Center this year for Christmas, please come to the Senior Center building and ask for the director, Brenda Renfro or Mary Ashford. If you would like to donate any items to help, you can bring them to the Senior Center, Senior Center or call the Senior Center at 298-4460 and ask for Mary Ashford and she will pick them up. Thank you for helping the seniors in your community. That's from Ohio County Senior Services. And now I'm going to, my drawing is over there, I'll be right back. The January Business in the Spotlight is National Office Furniture. Rob Johnson. Thank you. And get your tickets out. The door prize, which was donated uh, and provided by Ohio County Healthcare. Thank you. The number is 887144. <laughs> Rob, it's your lucky day. You need to play lottery. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, does anybody have any other announcements um, that we need to bring forth? Joe Beth, are you here? Anything going on in Beaver Dam? I am here. <laughs> um, yes, we have the Downtown Christmas Festival December 6th and 7th. Um, we give away $5,000 in toys. So if you know a family would like to come out, we can drive and horse and carriage rides, a holiday bake off. Okay. We have 25 vendors this year. Chase, we got anything going in Hartford? Not December? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought there was some kind of Christmas thing going on. It's this Saturday. Oh, okay. Okay. 
All right, so if uh, there's not any other announcements, I would like for Sarah Stone to come up and introduce our guest speaker for today. Hi, everyone. Um, for today's program, we're going to have New Beginning Sexual Assault Support Services. They're going to be coming and talking about one of their violence prevention programs. Um, we have three speakers. Our first one is going to be Crystal Wall. She is the volunteer coordinator for New Beginnings. She's responsible for recruitment, training, and supervision of the Crisis Intervention Volunteer Advocates. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in elementary education for w from WKU in 2002. And she's been with New Beginnings since 2016. So if you want to stay in, Crystal, this is Crystal. Um, our next is going to be Shelly Nichols. She's a 1996 graduate of University of Kentucky College of Social Work. She was drawn to victims work and especially interested in working with women and parent survivors of interpersonal violence. She spent seven years working in three different domestic violence programs in three different states as an advocate, counselor, and supervisor. In 2003, she became an assistant administrator for victim services through the Ohio County Department of Rehabilitation and Correction, where she assisted in victim offender dialogues and supported victims' families through the execution process. In 2016, she became the executive director of OASIS, that's the Owensboro Area Shelter and Information Services, where she worked for two years. She's currently the prevention educator for New Beginning Sexual Assault Support Services, and she's currently living in Owensboro, Kentucky with her husband and two sons, Cameron and Carter. So Shelly, if you want to stand. And then last but not least, we'll have Rhonda Howard. She is the Prevention Coordinator for New Beginnings and responsible for educating the community on violence prevention. She is the Chair of the Owensboro Davis County Prevention Team and a member of the PIC Committee for Kentucky Association of Sexual Assault Programs. She has been with New Beginnings since 2007, having spent the previous 10 years teaching children in grades 2 through 4. She earned a Bachelor's of Science in Elementary Education from WKU in 1994. So please stand, Rhonda. Please help me welcome them. So you girls can go ahead and come up and I'll get your slideshow ready. Well, we're not going to do the slides yet. Oh, you're not? Just one second. I'm going to introduce. Uh, so I am Crystal Wall. I am the volunteer coordinator at New Beginnings. Uh, we have an office right here on Main Street. And I wanted to introduce um, the two people that are in that office. And they can describe what they do. I'm uh, Crystal Newton, and I am a, an LCSW, which means I can do therapy without having supervision. And so I see clients here in this county. I probably have about 20 on my caseload right now, um, which means we may go to a waiting list. So if you know anybody who has issues with any type of sexual violence, any family or friends also, <coughs> um, from age three to five, 10, however old, uh, men, women, and children, that's you can see me here in Ohio County. And uh, my name is Alyssa Roberts, and I'm the victim advocate in Ohio County. Um, I do crisis counseling, and I also do legal advocacy, so I help some of the people that have gone through sexual violence and are seeking legal ramifications for that. So I just wanted to be brief and explain our need here in Ohio County for volunteers. So. To be a volunteer, our biggest need would be a volunteer advocate, and that would be taking on call. Staff is always on call as well, but taking on call after hours um, and on the weekends. And to be on call, we have somebody else will answer our crisis line, but if you're on call in Ohio County and somebody's called in crisis, then that call will go over to you, so you're answering it from your home or wherever you might be. Uh, and it could be somebody that you know, has maybe woken up in the middle of the night and they're having a night terror. They're having some trouble falling back asleep. So we're going to answer that call and we're going to give them some coping skills to get them through that moment. Um, or it could be a call that there's a victim at the emergency room. And um, it's the law that when somebody goes to the emergency room that they call for an advocate to be present. And so you do some training with me, but to have an advocate here in Ohio County is so crucial. <coughs> you can get to them much quicker than say I could be that lives in um, Owensboro. It's going to take me 30 minutes, maybe longer in the dark to get here. So to be that first point of contact, you are 
that first person that is going to help them in their healing process. And we want them to know that they have many rights. They have many choices. Uh, and we want to be there with them through that process. And we want them to know that we're never going to make any decisions for them. We're just going to give them the choices and let them make their own decisions. And we're there to believe them. We're there to believe them and to support them always. So there would be some training with me. It's an awesome thing to be with somebody. And I hate to use the word awesome, but to be with somebody in their most traumatic time, but to know that you're, hopefully, you are their first steps in healing. But in closing, I want to say, and I say this all the time when I go back to my office, every time I'm in Ohio County, you all are an incredible community. And I do say this all the time. If you can have the best experience at the hospital with the victim, it came from Ohio County. Nobody wants to get that call at 2 o'clock in the morning, but you all should be proud of this community. I walked away with tears in my eyes. Of course, it's always hard what we do, but with tears in my eyes because I had a doctor. I had nurses. I had law enforcement. I had everybody collaborating um, for this victim. You all are very victim informed You're very trauma-informed, and I can't thank you enough. So be very proud of what you did because you're awesome. You all do really good stuff. So thank you all. I'm going to have now Shelly and Rhonda. They are going to come and talk about the Green Dot. That is our bystander intervention. Prevention. 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 Intervention. <laughs> Can we take this off? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And so I want you to imagine the wedding part's over and you're walking into the reception. And in the reception, it's one of those party receptions. You got the DJ in one corner, lights, music, all that, you know, nice spread of food, um, the cake. And then over in the other, in, in a corner, is the alcohol. And there's tons of alcohol being served. There's cakes of beer, there's whiskey, I don't know, what are this stuff called? Champagne, all kinds. All right, and you do your thing. You go in, you find your seats. If you're like me, you kind of save some seats for the family you want to come sit next to you. And you start watching as people come through the door. And you see, um, you know, you're waiting for people that you want, like your family. So you can wave at them and say, hey, we're over here. And you notice that two twins walk in. And you do that thing that people do when they see twins. They nudge the person next to them. They say, oh, look how cute. They look just alike. And they do. They're identical. They look like they're probably in middle school, so maybe 7th grade, maybe 8th grade. They're dressed exactly the same. Okay, and then you go, we notice that, and you go back doing your own thing. The party comes, the wedding party comes in, everybody's having a good time, everybody eats, they have cake, and then everybody starts, the music starts, and everybody gets out on the dance floor and starts dancing. So you're sitting there and you look up, and you notice that the two twins are out on the dance floor and they're dancing. And they're dancing with, you know, kids their own age, having a really good time. So you get up and do whatever. You might get up, if, if you're my kids, they get up and have cake. I don't know how many pieces of cake they have. You might get up and go talk to someone you know. It's been about 35 minutes later and you look up and you happen to notice that the twins have separated. And one's still on the dance floor dancing, having a good time. And the other one is over standing by where the alcohol is being served. And she's talking to a guy that's a lot older than her. She's probably like 12, 13. He looks like he's old enough to drink. So maybe 20, 21. He was in the wedding party. He has like the vest and the tie undone. And you do that thing that most people do. You're like, ah, oh, that's no big deal. Maybe, you know, they're know each other maybe they're related but then as you continue to watch you happen to notice that he seems really flirty and he's really being a little touchy not only that he keeps passing his cup to her so you're pretty sure he's given her alcohol and you had that feeling in your gut don't look at me I'll cry <laughs> that this is wrong. You have that feeling in your gut that that's just not right. But you also have all those things going in your head that, hey, you know, it's none of my business. I don't know this family. It's on the other side of the wedding. I, what, I don't even know what to do. Their parents are here. Somebody's watching her. Somebody has to take care of her. That's not my job. And you go about and you do your thing. About it. 45 minutes later, you happen to look up, you're talking to a group of your family, and out of the corner of your eye, you spot her again. And this time, he has his arm around her. I don't know what, I told you I was emotional today. And he's walking her out the side door. And she's clearly intoxicated. And you have no idea why he would be walking her out to the back door. Now that door is just a hallway, it's a dark hallway that goes up some dark steps. And I stop the story here. Because as a bystander, once they're out that door, that's it. You don't know what happens. Unless you get out and follow her, you're, you have no idea. But in your gut, you know it's not good. There's no reason he would be leading her out to a dark hallway. I also saw the story here because this is my story. So if you're wondering when I get emotional, it's my story. This is my story. And as I'm writing in that journal, I totally forgotten it. And the first thing I remembered was being 13, sitting on my bed the next day and telling myself just to forget about it. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. Forget about it. Forget about it. I did a really good job because I hadn't thought about it in years. I just totally forgot that that had happened. Um, the other reason I share this story is because you're probably thinking she was sexually assaulted because I get so emotional. And I wasn't sexually assaulted because there was a person at that reception who saw what was happening instead of saying, 
Um, that's none of my business. I don't know what to do. They went and got my parents and said, this is what's going on. You need to get your daughter now. And my dad came and got me out of the hallway. So I get this emotional remembering this story, not only because I'm thankful that there was somebody there that could, that protected me, that saved me, that changed my life. Because I know if I get this emotional over something that almost happened, can't imagine how it would have changed my life if it had happened. So this is my connection. This is what Green Dot's about. It's about being that bystander that figures a way to make someone safer. So I want you to take a moment, real brief moment, and I want you to imagine someone you love. You can have more than one person. Pick someone you love for the people you love. Think about all the things that make those people special. Now I want you to put them somewhere. They could be at school, they could be at work, they could be in a parking lot, they could be at a party. But you're not there. And I want you to imagine that there's a person there that wants to harm that person that you love. They're going to hurt your loved one. Now put a bystander there. There's another person that sees exactly what's going on, that could step in, that could do something to stop your loved one from being hurt. They could call 911. They could reach out and say, hey, come with me. Just check in and say, are you okay? But instead, they say whatever they have in their head, none of my business, I don't know what to do, and they turn around and they walk away. And they leave your loved one there to get hurt. Oh no, it's broken. <coughs> Hold on. There's an important reminder. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> okay, now try it. Okay. All right. I know when I do this, I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Are you going to really not do anything? You're just going to leave my loved one to get hurt. I get mad at that bystander. But the reality, in reality, this story is how it plays out most of the time. 89% of the time, there's a bystander there that could do something, and that bystander chooses to do nothing. Thank you for sharing your story, Rhonda, as always. We are here today because we know that too many people are being hurt by power-based personal violence. And what I mean by power-based personal violence is anytime someone exerts power and control over another person. And specifically what we're going to be talking about today is dating and domestic violence, stalking, sexual violence, and child abuse. The reality is scary and we have a real problem. We know that one out of four girls and one out of six boys will be sexually assaulted before the age of 18. Let that sink in. We know that one in three women and one in four men have experienced domestic violence. And this is the saddest of all. More than four children die from child abuse every day. So the bottom line is that we know that too many people are being hurt. Okay, so with the numbers that high, you have to know, when we say one in three, one in four, that you are literally going to be in a situation where you're either that bystander. You're that bystander and you have to make a choice because someone is about to be hurt. Or you're going to be in a situation where your loved one, just like I said, is somewhere and they're depending on a bystander to step in to help them, to get them out of that situation. So the thing is, as a people, we're all bystanders. As people, we have two choices. We have the choice to do something or the choice to do nothing. There's no neutral if you say I'm neutral, I don't, I'm not a violent person, I don't hang around with violent people. If you say neutral and the situation arises, then you just did nothing. So you have two choices. And so when we're doing this, be, make sure you own those choices. When we talk about this today, this is the choice I want to make. Which one do I want to make? Our choices. They are the essence of our being. 
Who we are comes down to the choices we make. When we are faced with a high risk or problematic situation, we only have two choices, do something or do nothing. You are about to meet people who have done both. Like all of us, they each decided to act or not to act based on their own obstacles. And in that choice, they defined themselves. First, a lab technician named Dwayne Taylor was on his way home after midnight on a subway train and was asleep in his seat. A person who did not know Dwayne ushered his six-year-old son to his seat on the train, took a hammer out of his backpack, and without provocation attacked the sleeping Dwayne with the hammer. Ten adults moved out of the way or stood by while he was beaten. One bystander took Dwayne's cell phone that fell from his pocket during the attack. Lauren Chief Elk and April Grohl are 20-year-old Anza college students and teammates on the school's soccer team. They were leaving a party at a house when they realized something was wrong in a back room where the doors were closed and the lights were off. They told police, we heard and saw a girl tapping on this door in the kitchen saying, there is a girl in there with eight guys. They tried to get in the room but were confronted and told to mind their own business. They watched what was happening through a crack in the door. They decided it was their business and busted in the room to get the girl held there out of the house. They reported the incident to the police. A man in D.C. recalled his bystander experience. He said, I was on the D.C. Metro rail line. A woman standing near me suddenly collapsed on the floor. My brain didn't even seem to register what happened. I was just looking around trying to figure out what was going on. In the meanwhile, another woman bent down to hold the first one's head and someone else called the train operator. When we arrived at the next station, a few people got off with the woman, and I saw them as we pulled out, standing with her, making sure she was okay. Why didn't I think of any of that? In Hartford, Connecticut, police released a chilling video of a 78-year-old man trying to cross the street with a carton of milk. He steps off the curb just as two cars that appear to be racing swerve on the wrong side of the street. The first car swerves around the man, the second car hits him and throws him into the air like a doll, then speeds away. What follows is even more chilling. People walk by. Nine vehicles pass him lying in the street. Some drivers slow down to look but drive away. No one helped until a police car arrived. A quick-thinking commuter saved a teenager who apparently suffered a seizure and fell onto subway tracks in Upper Manhattan by jumping onto the tracks himself and pushing them both between the rails beneath the oncoming train. On the New York City subway, it's hard enough finding someone who will give up his seat to a stranger, let alone be willing to give up his life for one. The train was coming in right, right like that. It happened just... 50-year-old Wesley Autry, a construction worker and Navy veteran, was standing on a subway platform with his two little girls, when right in front of them, a man started having a seizure. He kind of stumbled and over his own feet and fall backwards. I see a train coming, but the train is so close, I'm like, what do I do? Wesley jumped onto the tracks and thought if he could just lie on top of the man, keep him from flailing, maybe the train would roll right over both of them. The clearance was exactly 21 inches. Wesley and the man, 20 and a half. There's no way the train can stop before this gentleman could get him, get him up off the tracks. So he covered him with his body and pushed him down to a point where the train wouldn't hit his head and held him down under the tracks while the train came and rolled right over the top. It gave Wesley's children the scare of their young lives. I thought he was going to get killed. And Wesley, the scare of his, too. I'm like talking, I'm sorry, you can't move. I got two kids up here looking for the father to come back. I don't know you, you don't know me, but listen, don't panic. You know, I'm here to save you. As for the guy Wesley saved, he's 20-year-old Cameron Hollipter. And other than a few scrapes and bruises, his father says he's doing fine. Mr. Autry's instinctive and unselfish act saved our sense of life. You know, the word hero gets thrown around a lot nowadays. What a better way to say it's to start up the new year than to save, save a life. <laughs> nice to be reminded of what one really looks like. Steve Hartman, CBS News, New York.
Each of these individuals faced a crisis. And that's an incredible story about that last bystander. But I just earlier I told you all what our numbers look like and how many people are being hurt. And we know that if we want to reduce the number of people that are being hurt, we must have a cultural change. That's a must. And I know when you think about a culture change, you probably think, oh, that's, that's too overwhelming. How can I be a part of that? That's too much. It makes me want to stop before I even start to think about a culture change. But in reality, cultures change all the time. They change in the clothes we wear, the music that we listen to, and our hairstyles. I know a few of you in here had 80s hair. I guarantee it. See, I, say that to, I can't say that to the high schoolers. They don't know what 80s hair is. Um, and we also have a picture of music up there. Who did we say that was? Twisted Sister and Rat? The high schoolers don't know who those are. <laughs> Some of them do. Some of them. Every once in a while we'll run across. But we know we have to have a change in culture, and we know that change in culture happen all the time. And also bigger changes in culture like the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement. So cultures change all the time. The question isn't, though, can we change the culture? The, ch the question is, how do we change our culture? Probably the most recent culture change um, that we have experienced is the creation of Facebook. I know everybody in this room has Facebook. I can pretty much guarantee it. That's another thing we can't say to the high schoolers because they don't have Facebook. But Facebook all started with a student at Harvard, Mark Zuckerberg, he was hanging out in his dorm room one day and said, you know what, I'm going to create a social network. And he created it, he invented it, he took just, took just a few moments, put in an email and a password, and bam, he had Facebook. But that's not what changed the culture. Mark soon told 10 to 20 of his friends about Facebook. They took a few minutes, right? They put an email in and a password, bam, they had Facebook. But that didn't change the culture either, because that was only a group of people that were getting onto Facebook. But soon those 10 to 20 people told more people, and soon at Harvard there were tens of hundreds of thousands of tens of thousands of students that were getting on Facebook. And the culture was starting to change. And then from there, Facebook started going into the high schools and started going into the communities, and even our grandmas were on Facebook. So Facebook changed our culture forever. And now we, ha we know that there are millions of people on Facebook. But the lesson that we learned, and what you're probably wondering what my point is, is that it's not one person that did one thing that changed the culture. So it wasn't Mark Zuckerberg who invented Facebook that changed the culture. It was all the people who took the moment to get on Facebook and to like and to share and to post. That's what changed our, cult our culture. All right, so we're getting to the point why it's called Green Dot. This is my favorite part. Um, so the creator of Green Dot actually worked at the University of Kentucky. Yay. And um, she was um, trying to figure out how can I protect these kids at the university because the rates of violence was so high. So she was sitting and watching um, a show like I Am Legend or some zombie movie or whatever. And in the middle of this, uh, at the beginning of the movie, there's a screen. It looks similar to the screen, but maybe more techy. But there's all these scientists and the president, and they're all standing around. They're talking about this horrible epidemic that's going through the United States. These people turn into zombie creatures. And um, every red dot that was on that map represented when somebody was catching this horrible disease that was turning them to zombie creatures. And so as the red dots, it first started out as a few red dots, no big deal, right? And then like every two seconds, there'd be a new red dot on this map. And just to imagine how that would feel. And as she's watching this, she's like, wait a minute, this is real. This is, um, if you imagine now, a map of our community. And those red dots on that map are rates of violence that our community sees every day. And I didn't just throw out two, just throw out the two seconds. Actually, in the United States, every two seconds, someone is hurt by some type of violence. 
So if we were actually for real, and I, oh, there they are, if every two seconds there's a red dot, by the time I stopped my sentence, that map would be glowing red. So a red dot is just a choice someone makes to hurt someone else. A red dot could be uh, domestic violence. Someone hurts the person um, that they're supposed to love. Or it could be um, sexual violence like mine at a party. Someone has sex with somebody without consent or harassment or stalking. So the solution is the green dot. So a green dot is whenever ever someone uses their words, their actions, or their behavior to stop the red dot from actually happening. So that's where green dot comes from. So green dots don't have to be big deals. You don't have to save somebody from a burning building to do a green dot. It may simply be checking in on someone you've been worried about. Or maybe it's calling 911. Or maybe it's getting someone home from a party safely. All those are green dots. And as you see, the green dots over the red dots, we're changing our culture. So you're probably wondering, well, that's no big deal, right? Why didn't everybody just do green dots? Why doesn't everybody intervene when they see a red dot from happening? But what we know is that green dots can be hard to do because people have obstacles and they have barriers in their life. They have personal barriers, they have relationship barriers, and they have general barriers. So some personal barriers might be somebody might feel very shy, or they're embarrassed, or they're scared, or they're introverted, so they don't want to get involved. Or a relationship barrier might be uh, like among their coworkers, for instance. Maybe they don't want to look like a snitch or a party pooper. And a general barrier, and I, and I think of this one often, is when there are a lot of bystanders in a room and nobody's doing anything, you think, why should I? Right? Or if nobody else is d doing anything, maybe this is not a big deal. And this is some more about barriers. Have you ever been in a crowd and a fight starts? Or seen a video of people being brutalized while bystanders just mill around? Why don't we step in and help? What's wrong with people? Hey there friends, thanks for watching D News today. I'm Trace. In 1964, Kitty Genovese was raped and murdered in New York City. People nearby who were aware the crime was being committed did nothing. Psychologists called this the bystander effect. According to the National Crime Victimization Survey, two-thirds of all violent crime victimizations had a bystander. The news constantly cycles cell phone videos of fights, arrests, shootings, brutalization, and they occasionally feature bystanders who are just milling around. Bystander in full effect. What is going on here? Psychologists have found humans and groups are less likely to come to the aid of someone in need, even if they would have jumped to a rescue when alone. In one 2014 study, five-year-olds refrained from helping a confused experimenter when in a group, but readily assisted when they were alone. Other studies have shown this extends to online environments too. But still, what the heck? Shouldn't we just want to, like, help people all the time? The bystander effect seems to be a combination of two things pluralistic ignorance, and diffusion of responsibility. Pluralistic ignorance is the idea that without ever saying anything to other members of a social group, we assume everyone is on the same page. When other people don't act, we assume that everyone has decided it's fine. We are all social group animals, not solitary ones, and thus, we look to those around us for social prompts. Diffusion of responsibility says that we are less likely to take responsibility when others are present, because the responsibility is now spread across everyone. This is multiplied in emergency situations where we have to act quickly and make decisions without being able to talk it out. It seems comical to shout that, shouldn't someone do something? But that's kind of how our minds work. We've diffused the responsibility to that group, and what we want to do overall is kind of ambiguous. Thus, no one makes a decision, and we all become victims of the bystander effect. A 1969 experiment in American scientists put people in a room and asked them to fill out a questionnaire. Then, researchers slowly filled the room with smoke. When alone, 75% of the subjects noticed the smoke right away and calmly went to report it. But when other researchers were in the room pretending to be subjects who wouldn't react no matter what happened, only 10% of the people reported the smoke, even when it got so thick that they couldn't read the questionnaire they were supposed to be filling out. Security cameras have been found to reduce the strength of the bystander effect because we want to perform a good deed for this imagined audience. But that doesn't translate to cell phone cameras. 
A clinical psychologist told Boston Magazine, we tend to get reinforced for recording fights with our cameras. It can show up on the news, or it can get a million hits on YouTube, or it could increase social status with your friends. Plus, the footage may help an authority bring the right person to justice or solve the issue later, which reinforces personal recordings further, but not actual action. So is there a cure for the bystander effect? Yes. Someone just has to act. If someone jumps in the pool to save a splashing kid, takes charge and tells someone to call 911 after someone's injured, or steps in to stop a fight, responsibility is no longer diffused amongst the group, and the pluralistic ignorance is broken. Someone has acted. It is easy to think that you would do something different when watching a video at home by yourself, but standing with other people in the moment complicates things pretty intensely. People who do act are called active bystanders. <laughs> Alright, so the idea, if you notice, we have a new image in the Turk community map. And we have these red dots, right? And so we started covering them with reactive green dots, and that's when we intervene, when we see something happening. But then we also have to be proactive. So if you see the big green that's covering up all this empty space where other red dots could happen, we want to make sure that red dots don't get on our map. We have to let people know that violence isn't okay and that everybody has to do their part to make sure that violence doesn't happen in our community. So how do we do that? We talk to people about Green Dot or violence prevention. We let people know that a joke's not funny when it's at somebody's, ex you know, um, making fun of somebody else. Um, we step in when we see something happening. We wear a button or we take a brochure and we let other people know. We have to fill up that white space with proactive actions, letting people know that we care about violence and we don't want to have it in our community. So what I'm saying is when um, you leave here, I know we did this really fast, but when you see a situation where you can step in or you can, you can do something or you can ask questions, put some green dots on the map. That's all we're asking is that when you can do something to help someone else, do it. And that changes our culture. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you have any questions about it, let us know. Sorry. Thank you all. Um, just want to remind you that we will not have the regular December meeting, that it will be the chamber meeting, I mean the Christmas gala. So I'll put that on your calendars for December 17th. And if you haven't um, signed up for sponsorship, please do that with Judy. And everybody have a wonderful Thanksgiving. <laughs>